Many plants we eat as vegetables, others have medicinal uses. But there are rare and special plants that generate visions or hallucinations if they are eaten or ingested. In our culture, we associate such experiences with illegal drugs, but there are many cultures for whom these plants are seen as sacred and regarded as a key to another mystical world. As an archaeologist and anthropologist, over the past 20 years I have become fascinated by these plants and their cultural importance and have been engaged in a quest to uncover their secrets. Salvia divinorum is thought by some to contain the most powerful natural hallucinogen known to man. Yet the effect of the actual plant is strange and elusive, and hardly anything is known about it in the West. Despite the dangers of taking any hallucinogen, to uncover the secrets of this sacred plant, once again a team of specialists was gathered. The effects of salvia have never been recorded scientifically, and over the next few days the team would help carry out a series of unique scientific experiments. Volunteers were to take a strictly controlled dose, and we would record the outcome. I felt actually as if somebody had said something extremely funny, or as if there was something extremely funny, but I wasn't quite sure what that was. I realized that the reflectors were connected to the reality of the, uh, the kind of individuals that I knew and how all the people made up my life. We've known about Central and South American cacti, such as peyote or San Pedro, for a long time. But until 20 years ago, we had no knowledge at all about Salvia divinorum. Used by the Mazatec Indians, a small and remote tribe in Central America, it was discovered in the 1950s. And it's only in the last decade that the active ingredient has been identified. Might the experiment enable us better to understand how salvia has become so important to the Mazatecs? And might it also cast light on salvia's mind-altering effects, or identify previously unknown toxic effects? Ah, Francoise, hello. Hello, Andre. Great, very nice yes. you could make it. Well, I'm very happy and to be here. Francoise Friedman was my first guest. An anthropologist at Cambridge University, she had made a special study of the use of salvia in Native American culture. And you've spent a lot of time in Mexico. I've spent some time in Mexico, mm -hmm. more time in South America, but I, yes. I, I find the Mesotec and all the people of Oaxaca really interesting mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Ah, good, here's Tim. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Tim Kendall was the next to arrive. A consultant psychiatrist and director for the Centre for Psychotherapeutic Studies, he brought a very different expertise to the team. You think it's very different to other hallucinogenics? Yes, yes. My experience is working with people who are hallucinated usually from emotional causes. I'm very, very interested in how this might appear and work with people who take salvia. The final guest was John Robbins, a pharmacologist from King's College in London. I hoped he might help us to understand how salvia acted on the brain. It's interesting that you say um, you chew the leaves. I mean, that must be a very slow way of getting it into the body as opposed to smoking. Yes, I, I've, I've read somewhere, actually, in one of the papers that the action takes place through the, through the saliva. Oh, right, so, so it's better actually not to swallow. You don't swallow at mm -hmm. all. But I, I was actually anxious to hear your, your response to this paper. Once the guests were assembled, I gave a brief guide to Salvia's remarkable history. The plant we're considering today grows in a very restricted area of Central America, in the province of Mexico called Oaxaca. It's a mountainous and very rugged area, hard to move around in even today, and it's inhabited by the Mazatec Indians. Living in this fairly remote region, they've kept many of the practices of their traditional culture. One of them is this plant, Salvia divinorum. It belongs to the same family as common garden mint, and yet its effects are quite different. 
It's very rare and native only to a small part of Mexico where it's considered sacred. The name means the diviner's sage, and it's used in religious ceremonies, both for curing illness and also to gain visions. And these can be used either to secure supernatural help, or even visions of where some lost object can be located. The use of this plant may well go back to the Aztecs, who ruled Central America before the arrival of the Europeans. Today, the plant plays an important part in the faith of the Mazatec Indians, by inducing visions of the Virgin Mary, who is considered to be the patroness of this plant, and indeed it's called Herba Maria Pastora, the herb of Mary the Shepherdess. Well, this is clearly a most intriguing plant, and the question is really how it's come to have this special status and how it's to be seen as actually sacred and the way in which it seems to give access to these hidden stores of knowledge and memories. Francoise, you've studied the Mesotech Indians and the role that this plant plays in it. What do you think? I think salvia has a very, uh, is a very unique plant which has played quite a unique role. And I think we should be prepared to look into what the indigenous people themselves say about it. The Mazatec approached the plant as a learning aid to become a shaman and to get insights about the creation of the world and the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And as an anthropologist, I consider it my, my role to actually convey their interpretation of how the plant gives access to hidden knowledge about healing, about hidden places and about the properties that it can give access to. And we have here a recording uh, which was made of Maria Sabina, who was one of the most famous women healers mm -hmm. among the Mesotech. And this is a recording of her chanting. <laughs> She explains how the plant gives access to uh, medicine and medical knowledge in her own culture. Tim, you come to this uh, question of hallucinations from the point of view of someone who is studying mental illness. What do you think about these descriptions? What I think is interesting is that whatever the cause of hallucinations, they are subject to psychological explanations, that they have relevance to the person concerned. And I suppose that's what, you know, as a psychiatrist, I can bring to this. Yes. John, this plant seems to have very interesting properties for the pharmacologist. What do you feel may lie behind its special cultural role? Well, I think as a pharmacologist, I'm interested in how compounds and including drugs interact with the brain very physically. Here I've got a, a nice three-dimensional picture of the, um, one of the active compounds, and probably the major one, salvinorin A. It doesn't act on the outside of cells, like other hallucinogenic mm -hmm. compounds. And indeed, other chemical substances like this, which is known as a diterpene, seem to act within cells. And this may explain, possibly, its mechanism of action being slightly different from uh, the classical run-of-the-mill hallucinogens. Mm -hmm. So it may be a new substance uh, or a new mechanism of action for this substance and that would be interesting pharmacologically and may lead to a greater understanding of the brain in the long term. It was time to meet our first and very special volunteer. Daniel Siebert had flown in from the west coast of America to be with us. Although not an academic or a chemist, he successfully isolated salvinorin A and was the first person to show that this was the active chemical compound in salvia, publishing his results in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology. Well, we're very lucky to have uh, Daniel Siebert here, and I suppose the question that we're all really wanting to, to know is what it actually feels like to take this plant, what sort of experiences it gives rise to. Well, I've had uh, quite a range of experiences with the plant and 
um, in different forms, uh, done in the traditional manner of chewing the leaves as well as um, experimenting with other methods of ingestion, uh, such as smoking the leaves. Um, the plant, um, it's, you know, it's a very powerful consciousness-altering herb. Mm -hmm. um, I find that it's very useful for um, gaining personal insight. It's not something that um, really lends itself to any kind of recreational use. It seems to be a very profound experience. Yes. Do you actually see things that aren't there? I mean, that's what most people think of as hallucinations. Right. It depends on the amount of salvia taken. Yes, it can do that. Uh, usually it doesn't. Usually um, it's not strong enough to produce that effect, although it, it clearly can. Unlike Daniel, our second volunteer, Sean, had no special previous experience of taking salvia. And you're a writer by... Uh... Yeah, that's right, a sort of travel journalist, really, and do some radio work as well. Mm -hmm. So um, you're used to reporting your feelings and your experiences? Yeah, especially sort of to people who may not have been to the same places, which um, may or may not have some relevance to what we're going to do. Um, but it's, yeah getting over a feeling of, of, of trying to describe something other and something alien and something foreign um, to people uh, who won't have any of the same reference points as I do, trying to describe it in a way that will be meaningful to them. You must have had some sort of um, imaginings about what it might be like to do this. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, Can you say a bit? I've been told that it's, you know, it's, it's ritual and, and it's used in sort of ceremony. Um, and so that's something that's informing me. It's going to be a trip of some sort, I would imagine, um, and that's not something that uh, I'll take lightly, but uh, you, know, you guys are all experts and you'll all be there, so I know I'm safe. The experiment tomorrow will be the first time that Salvia has been subjected to such scrutiny. What will it reveal about the experience? And is it possible that it may help us to understand its sacred status amongst the Mazatecs? We had gathered to find out why Salvia Divinorum is said to give rise to visions and is considered sacred. Would we be able to unlock the mysteries of this plant, so central to the culture of the Mazatec Indians? Okay, now I'm going to take your blood pressure. So I'm going to put a, uh, a blood pressure cuff around your arm. Before they consume the plant, Tim Kendall gave the volunteers a physical examination. He noted blood pressure and body temperature, both of which might be dramatically altered by the plant and which would indicate that it was having an effect. Feeling relaxed? Um, I'm quite relaxed. Okay. Mm -hmm. John wanted to discover more about the effect of salvia on the brain. Using an EEG machine, he would be able to register Daniel's brain activity, both before and during the experience of taking the plant. What we're looking at here is um, a number of recordings, EEG recordings. Now, what the EEG can show us is a snapshot or a, at least a reflection of the activity in the brain. What we're looking for is a dream stage of sleep, known as REM sleep, where there's relaxed body but high-frequency brain activity which is dreaming, which is maybe our sort of natural hallucinations. If salvia itself produces hallucinations, it might be that it produces a similar effect to a dream state in a subject. Um, okay. Daniel was about to take a plant containing the most potent natural hallucinogen known to man. He did so under strict medical supervision. Salvia might have unpleasant or even dangerous side effects. Okay. <sighs> okay. At 
235, Daniel, as the experienced volunteer, was the first to smoke a controlled dose of the plant. He had told us that the experience characteristically would only last about 30 minutes, but that at the beginning, in the first moments after smoking salvia, the hallucinations might be so intense that he would be unable to describe them to us, or indeed to speak at all. Immediately after you took it, your blood pressure went up to about 190 over 106. Uh -huh. And now it's coming back down again. Uh -huh. So it goes quite high. Uh -huh. Your pulse rate increased, but not massively. Huh. As Salvia started to weaken its hold, Daniel was able to begin to describe his experience. Yeah, everything looked like it was made out of reflectors like the kind that are on little posts along the side of the road. It's like uh, those little round red reflectors, orange ones. It looked like this little stripe was a whole row of them and went up the side of your arm and made that little chain that went up there and all those things were gray and red and gray and um, orange reflectors um, making up the shapes up there. And then I realized that the reflectors were connected to the reality of the uh, the kind of individuals that I knew and how all the people made up my life and it seemed as if everyone else in the room were people that I know in my life and people from my past and that they were and sort of like my almost as if I didn't quite go in their direction but it's as if my whole past went off into this direction and all my like associates went off into this direction they sort of all were made up by the people standing around here and it just sort of continued on. If I went out the side of the door, I'd see more people I knew and more people would be around there and my whole rest of my world would connect up. And of course, that's the same thing as the real world at some point. But on this experience, it's, it's very different. <laughs> I saw, um, I started feeling like I saw someone from my, uh, oh, like my childhood who was, um, I don't know, very, you know, I was three or four or something, some, a kid I used to play with named David. Yeah. David? Yeah. Daniel's experience had been reflective and thoughtful, and as with the known records of the Mazatec Indians, he'd remembered incidents and people from his past. Would Sean's experience be similar? If you just close your eyes, right. okay, put your feet together. Okay. Sean was taking salvia for the first time and was understandably a bit nervous. Tim Kendall tried to put him at ease while he conducted some simple coordination tests. Of course, if you're very drunk, you might find this hard. Okay. And as you can see, he just comes straight back to normal. Yeah. Okay, would you like to try some now then? Yeah, that'd be nice. Okay. We knew that the initial impact of the plant was the strongest, but what effect would it have on Sean?
into it. And then before you finish sucking, take your finger off the hole. That's it. Excellent. Okay. Okay. How are you feeling? <clears throat> I'm feeling quite good. Suddenly disorientated. Okay. Do you think you'll be able to stand up? <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm finding that that's a very funny question. Okay. And that, that I might be able to, but I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's see if you can. That is so yeah. funny. Okay, let's see if you can stand up. <laughs> Right. Okay. right, it's all right. Okay. Right, now I'm going to remember the test we did before. I'm going to ask you to do the same one. Okay, if you can hold your arms out in front of you, okay, and close your eyes, keep your eyes closed, and I'm going to just nudge your arms, and I want you to push them back to where they were before. And as you can see, that's perfectly fine. A few moments later, Sean was able to talk. At the moment, I'm feeling. Like, um, well, like a lot of things are, f are funny. It's like there's a, a real. Mm, Try to say what's like, funny. Yeah. Uh, well, you know that nothing's actually humorous, but you feel extremely good. You're, you're feeling, um, I'm feeling very um, sort of mellow. I am getting visual distortion in the sense that certain things sometimes seem to be um, very liquid and it could be a long way away. The floor is quite a good way to get the visual effects. <laughs> look at the floor. If now. I look at the floor, yeah. Do yeah. is it still now? Yeah, it's um, it's because of the panelling. There's a lot of um, the crisscrosses of the of the panelling are looking sort of. Uh, there's a little visual trick going on where it looks like they could all be diamond shapes and going down for right. f well for bloody miles. Um, there's a piece of floor uh, which is sort of fairly dirty, and um, that could well, um, if, I, if I look at it, it can become, I can see it becoming sort of a, a, a much longer way away. Um, and it's like looking at sort of, I don't know, mountain peaks or something. It's lovely, actually. There's a feeling of ease in my body, right. of, of complete um, sort of floppiness and not, not necessarily having to... Um, of, of it being okay for me to sort of lose control in the sense of, of not having complete motor control, not being as steady as I was. Yeah. Um, and I'm quite aware that I'm probably not quite as steady as I was. We were particularly interested to know if Sean's experience bore any relation to the recorded effects of the plants among the Mazatec Indians, particularly its spiritual associations. Did you think of God at all? No. Not at all? I didn't, know. no. Um, if, however, I would... I've no doubt at all that if I was, if I, if I had that framework with which to work, I would have thought Eventually of those things. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was actually thinking of, of um, things like uh, Whistler paintings. I was, I was actually right. think, thinking of things in terms of, of, of the paintings I've seen and the, the, the films I've seen and, as I say, you know, um, visual images that I'm, I'm familiar with. Well, obviously the setting was rather artificial by comparison with some of the ethnographic uh, circumstances we were talking about, but I thought that brought out very well just what you were saying about the character of the plant, yes. this very gentle uh, effect that it has, just sort of euphoric. extending, yes, first of all euphoric, uh, and then, in a sense, encouraging perceptions, not, not certainly not causing hallucinations and not causing unreal perceptions, but just encouraging the mind to to see the fantasy of things around it. That's is right. is that how you found it? Yes, and also allowing the taker to remain in control about mm -hmm. going into the experience yes. or remaining on, on yes. the edge of it yes. and uh, playing with it. Yes, Fasc wasn't it fascinating the way in which she was deciding whether to stop and think about it or else to talk about it and to, and to explain it and just teetering on the edge there between yes between making it a private experience and keeping his uh, 
ability to explain things. And giggling because, at the same yeah, time. giggling at the same time. But he, he really did give a very, very coherent and yes. highly articulate yes. account. And yet, his impression was that, that he you was know, he was being coherent. incoherent, and, and yet he was. He was yes. giving a, a beautiful exposition. I thought that was very interesting. Mm. Very interesting. It's quite nice that the EEG results gave us quite positive negative results, as it were. No, there was indeed. absolutely no effect on the, the brain, as far as we could tell, with the EEG. No, indeed. And uh, that is significant. Um, with regard to the uh, physical tests, it was the uh, blood pressure and pulse and so on. Quite different. There was an effect, but it's very variable. I mean, yeah. in one, in one, uh, in the first subject, uh, there seemed to be peripheral shutdown. Temperature went up, uh, blood pressure went up. But with the second, although we didn't measure blood pressure, there's no doubt his periphery became quite warm. Mm. His pulse actually remained, if anything, it came down. It may be the initial state of the patient that's important. Or the subject. Yeah. As dusk fell, Sean joined Don and Tim in the woods, where he and Daniel would later consume the plant for a second time. They would be exposed to more subjective tests of mood and perception. But as with the tests earlier in the day, it was important to get a comparative description before the plant was taken. Visual information. So what I'd like from you is some sort of view of the what you're seeing at the moment and what right. you feel about what you see. Sure. And probably a good example is the tree here, which um, has got a number of colours and things on it, and just some idea from you what you feel about it and what, what you see. Well, um, obviously it's um, pretty rough texture-wise, but sort of um, scaly sort of green mossy streak running down this side, sort of, um, I don't know whether it, this must be north or something. It's silver birch, I think, isn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. Right. It looks like one to me. Good tree. <laughs> this time, the setting for taking the salvia was more like that of the private ceremonies of the Mazatec Indians. Daniel carried out a traditional ritual, marking out sacred space. And this time, the method of ingestion was also traditional, chewing the leaves of the plant. Using this method, the active compound in the plant was absorbed more slowly. The experience was likely to be longer, but more elusive. This might not seem quite too bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good batch. It's really more difficult when you try to swallow mm. because the, it's like your bitter receptors are in the back part of your tongue and you really get it when you try and swallow it. Mm. I'm going actually for a start, a distance of feeling like a general sense of strangeness about certain things around here, I have to say. Mm. <laughs> I notice um, with my eyes closed, I'm not really seeing much, but I have a distinct feeling like I'm in a stream. It's like the stream's moving from left to right, and it's almost to me, I feel like I'm seeing kind of a purplish blue stream flowing through, kind of right through where I know may perceive my body as. It's not as intense as when I smoked it earlier in terms of the effect. Actually, it's just kind of easier and mm. more fluid and feely. And, um, I'm much less, mm, I'm much more sort of disembodied and general floaty than I was. Mm -hmm. There's a definite feeling of separation between, I've, I feel that my mind has somehow mm -hmm. come out of my body. I'm actually watching my body moving its arms and legs mm. and hands and things. Hmm, interesting. Sean then returned to the tree which he had described earlier. Hang on. Yeah, I can... I can... Do you perceive the tree and... Do you have the same relationship to the tree as you normally do? Not at all, no. Before I felt it was a very kind of... Um, kind of organic looking thing and it was a very... It was, it was daylight and it was a very... Mm. Um, 
very sort of tactile tree and it was very it was warm and woody and mm -hmm. it was full of um you can just about see that, it used, that there are bits that you'd call green during the day, mm -hmm. but in between those there were lovely autumn sort of flecks of brown and things like that. Now it looks to me like it, it's more of a kind of carved from stone sort of thing, do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? With the sort of these bits standing out, the, the white bits standing out, and then just huge streaks of black shadow. The effects of the plant lasted late into the night but they seemed subtler and harder to gauge than they had been earlier in the day. Daniel and Sean remained seated around the fire until the early hours, and when morning came, they would have a lot to say about what had happened. You can, you can maybe begin to hallucinate that things have a very sort of, things stand out if, they're, if there's light on them, mm -hmm. a bit like the floor panelling earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, lines pointing one way, pointing another way can be. In the corridor. Oh, yeah. It's not a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? So I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know. The next day, I gathered the team together over breakfast to get some initial impressions. You know, it really just sort of clears out, and I feel refreshed, and like I starting. It's like getting a very good night's sleep. You know, it's like mm, you wake up refreshed. You feel cleared out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I feel. Yes, I do. I slept very soundly and very, very peacefully, actually. Later, we met in the library to watch a recording of some of the events of the previous day. Okay. Do you think you'd be able to stand up? <laughs> right, I think that that's a very funny question. Okay. <laughs> that I might be able to, but I don't think so. Okay. What was the meaning of Sean's laughter? John began our discussion with a straightforward explanation. I mean, the giggling's interesting because that suggests to me a removal of inhibition. I mean, yeah. normally you don't giggle most of the time. Usually when you're relaxed and enjoying something disinhibited, you start giggling. It wasn't giggling in the same way that if you're being um, physically tickled, yeah, which no. is... It was pleasurable giggling. It was actually yeah. giggling yeah, that yeah. felt very, Enjoy. very, very... Yeah, it felt very nice indeed, and it felt very positive, and it felt very... Um, That's almost the same as a small amount of alcohol. The moment um, that you say it's, it's similar to a small quantity of alcohol is the moment at which that becomes um, an absurd thing to say. I, I'd like to say that um, I think that there's different qualities of laughter. Um, when I have this kind of deep laughter experience with Salvia, it feels like it's coming from a very, very deep place, like from my core of myself, and I never have that with alcohol. Sometimes I might find things a lot more amusing and be, laugh more freely. Okay. Tim and Francoise were inclined to agree and saw in the laughter a deeper, more complex response. <laughs> What's interesting here is both of these two seem to know exactly what each other are talking about with regard to, say, this laughter. Laughter which is not specifically about something that they found funny, but a welling up from inside that, that this laughter is a very different sort of laughter. It may not be universal, but it's very common on people who take salvia. But, is that, but you're, so you're suggesting this is totally unique to this no. drug? No, I think, I, I think it's quite likely but there are other drugs which may have a comparable effect, but it seems to be one regular effect that salvia has. And the euphoria that salvia creates is perhaps distinctive. It's, it's, it's perhaps what we are trying to, to get at in this conversation. There is a specificity to the euphoria that salvia produces. Okay, if you can hold your arms out in front of you, okay, and close your eyes. Apart from John, the rest of the team thought the type of laughter we had seen was specific to Salvia. But why was it there? And what did it mean? And did it even, perhaps, hold the clue to the meaning of the experience? 
The difference between champagne giggling and uh, Sean's sort of giggling is is that it was there seemed to be some mental activity involved there, that it was his perception that caused the giggling mm. and not an emotional uninhibition. Wouldn't it be true to say that any question you were asked op opened the a paradox to you and, mm. and you perceive the fun from that because you could... You could that, see it one way or another. There was, it was like seeing a gap in the question. That's and what I was possibly, talking about it, earlier when I said that it, there was a massive yes. disparity between the fact that I was, I was seeing, as it were, seeing the, seeing the sort of puerile way I was behaving on the one hand, and at the very, you know, just giggling and being, acting the goat. And at the very same time, I was sort of um, off thinking... Right, now that's, yeah, that's really interesting. As I say, drawing comparisons with sort of painting and art and the things that are going on in the floor. Yeah. And it's being able to actually hold these both and weigh them and look, good God, you know, there's, there's, um, this is, on the one hand, extremely um, sort of just a, a shallow pleasure, and on the other hand, or, or on the one hand it's a floor, and on the other hand it's a, you know, it's actually g yeah. looks for all the world like it could well be a mountain range, you know. Yeah. And that, that's a, that, if that's not a source of giggling, um, a reason for giggling, that's, I don't know what is, you know. Could it be that through taking salvia, the individual catches sight of the ambiguity of the world, an ambiguity that is normally obscured and hidden from us? The orange ones look like this little stripe, this little whole row, and it went up the side of your arm, and maybe that little chain that went up there, and all those things were grey and red, and grey and um, orange reflectors. Unlike Sean, I was seeing things that were not there. I wasn't seeing a, a exaggerated illusion and that's what everything was. It was like a mosaic of these traffic reflectors. There were things in the room that could have triggered your response. So again, to me in the strict sense, a hallucination is seeing something that is not there. You, uh, you, all you did was possibly, I, I don't know because I didn't see it, but possibly it could be explained in you just misinterpreted what was there. Tim had an alternative account which challenged the idea that we normally see the world as it is and instead suggested that through perception we construct reality. Uh, you take in what information is available and you fill it in into holes so that you, see, you don't see just a set of lines, you see a television. And on the television you don't just see uh, another set of colours and lines, you see a face and we know that this face is Sean. You're doing that all the time routinely. Mm. Now that means that you're making this world as much as this world is coming into you. It's not, you know, perceiving is not a passive experience. Now, what, what I think is apparent from the discussion so far and what they've described is that they saw things differently. Now, whether or not we call one an illusion, which is meant to be a misinterpretation, or an hallucination, where you have a perception in the absence of an object out there, um, might not be quite the point. It yeah, may not right. be the point. No, I think. I think. I think uh, well, I think, I, th I think actually, Daniel did describe hallucinations. Yeah. On, on, in terms of what the, the lines on mine, the, the fact that you're seeing reflectors, there is no reflector whatsoever on my trousers. That is a proper hallucination. <laughs> yeah, that is a proper hallucination. The, their laughter, I think, is accurately portraying. Uh, a different perception of what's going on that the rest of us weren't seeing. I, I don't disagree with you in one sense. I disagree with the tone that it's coming over in, which is this is a sort of... We're all, you know, if you're normal and not taking the drug, you're missing something. Mm. There's something no, no, more no. out there. No, there isn't. No. All you're seeing is, is a slightly distorted no, view distorted. of what is there. Excuse me, people. I'd like to point out that one reason I think these plants are very useful, particularly something like Salvia divinorum, is that we develop a worldview and a way to consensually agree on, on what the world is. And we get so wrapped up in that perception, that cultural point of view, or human point of view, that most of us assume that's all it is. And we believe it so much that we don't like having that shaken up. It's threatening. And something like this says, look, remember, there's something else out there there's more to it than just the way you've been looking at it is there something mythical m magical uh, outside no, no. of the human experience that's coming in Actually, or is it just that there's a uh, you've got the, the same world that I'm talking about but you're just looking at it at a slightly different angle in, in, in lots of ways what I'd want to argue with you about is that there are many different ways of seeing things many different aspects many different 
ways of perceiving similar sorts of things. Now, we, we cannot grasp those things in themselves. We can't say, look, this is the reality of things. What we can do is we can come to some sort of judgment, some sort of evaluation about whether or not this particular way of saying things works, whether or not it's pleasurable, whether or not uh, we can see other ways or, or whatever. Mm. The, the, we do are, that when we grow up right. as children. But what I mean, you that, seem to be that, saying is there, the only, th there is one for. right way of seeing it. Mm. I don't know how we can know that. Sean and Daniel later returned to the forest where they had taken the salvia the previous night. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Part of the nation. Hmm. Yeah, so here's where we have the blanket. Oh, no. I remember all the, the flares out there. Everything looks so bland now, doesn't it? It's like... It does. I'm missing the two-tone effect of all the... You know, the light on one half of the tree and the... Blackness. The just complete blackness on the other, yeah. Yeah. I preferred it last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, last night it didn't seem like there was any sky... Well, cause yeah, it was exactly black yeah. behind, but it seemed like the leaves just made a continuous fabric of... Of almost like being in a tent. And we want now to get back to the question we began with about why this plant is so special in Mazatec society and what properties it has and what causes them. Francoise. Well, I, I have found the, the last two day sessions most illuminating in this very perspective. We have seen that taken in an experimental setting, in a control setting, Salvia produces the same effects which are described in the chants of the Massatex. Here we have two subjects who, don't, who are not aware of this context and yet come up with the same perceptions of total fun, hilarious uh, sense of, of perspective and uh, a euphoric, peace-inducing state of mind. Mm -hmm. Tim, what do you think we've learned? I suppose as a, as a starting off point, I'd say I think we have learned something about salvia. It does appear to have quite a significant impact upon the people concerned. Now, when it comes to one of the questions that we raised, which was that does salvia uh, aid, in a sense, the recall of memories or hidden, forgotten uh, memories, I suspect it probably does. I mean, certainly with Daniel, what we did see was that Daniel began to, began to, I think, get into a state where these things would have been much more accessible to him. John, do you agree with that description of what was actually happening? Hmm, I suppose not. It happens to have a psychotropic or psychomimetic compound in it, or compounds in it, that interfere with normal brain chemistry or brain activity, and that alters um, the perception of the world and you could find other substances that can do that as well. While John thought salvia was an interference, a negative threat to normal brain activity, Tim was more inclined to see it positively as enhancing memory. Daniel used the drug in, in a, in a, a semi-self-conscious way to explore in a space and that's almost what he, he did in front of us in, in the apparently experimental situation, he began to say, well, you know, look, the, 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 this space here is beginning to represent his, his own existence temporarily, and as the further you went away from where he was, the further backwards in time it went. And he even began to see a boy he hadn't seen for years and years and years, named him David. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I, 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 can't, I couldn't tell you where that would end. Mm. But it's persuasive enough for me to think that, that w w what, what these drugs might well be doing is making available to people competing interpretations of what's going on, yeah. internally and externally. Yeah. Both these effects the underlying difference in approach soon led to an argument about the potential uses of salvia. I would have thought that uh, as a candidate for, you know, for a, a more socially... Um, developed way of gaining different conceptions, different alternative competing ways of understanding the world we live in, our relationships, etc. I would have thought that, that this might be an exceptionally worthwhile drug if it was in the right, well-supported social context. I think the bottom line still is this is a, uh, a, a toxin. The plant made it as a toxin. This is a poison in reality. We don't know how it works. 
We don't know what really it does. You've got to do a risk-benefit thing on it. You know, what are the risks of taking this substance? What are the benefits? And at the moment, I can't really see any benefits apart from a mild, semi-delusional state that's quite enjoyable. So I wouldn't at all sanction taking this compound, and I certainly wouldn't take it myself. In, uh, I, I, I couldn't disagree with you more. I mean, uh, we're, we're talking about a culture who have used these sorts of things for a great deal, you know, for, for a considerable length of time. Um, if, if, if we were going to do randomised control trials on every aspect of our culture, we would be... Yeah, uh, yeah. we uh, ban alcohol, we ban nicotine. It wouldn't be just alcohol and nicotine. But I agree with John that we function within this culture and we have to abide by the rules yeah. and controls which operate no, in this culture. So randomised control trials have to be done if this plant is going to be used in a, clini in a clinical way to help people. Oh, okay. In a clinical um, way, there's no doubt about and, that. And even, and, but I disagree completely with John to say that this plant, the only uh, benefit of this plant is, is a mild recreational state. The, the plant is used by the Masatec as a tool, as an exploratory tool and as a teaching tool. And there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to translate it in our culture in those terms. You're right in one sense that that's probably all right in that culture and they see the benefit. But I'm not sure that in our society that will be a benefit. And we don't know what the risk is. I would want to know what the risks are. And so the obvious question that we've been living with for the last 24 hours, why is this plant thought to be sacred? Well, I think it comes down to it has a compound that interferes with our brain. Um, that interference creates something that's obviously pleasurable and interesting to the people using it, and um, they venerate that. Sacred probably because as an hallucinogenic, I would imagine used in, in the right context and with the right sorts of social pressures, could be regarded as gaining access to higher, more divine forms. And there's no doubt hallucinogenics, you know, they, they, they allow for that sort of experience to take place? I, w I would say that nothing is sacred by itself. It's, it's, it's sacred because it can be integrated in the way that it suits the culture best. And its very flexibility and gentleness allow exploration of the mysteries of creation. It was, however, my guest's understanding of the nature of these mysteries and whether a single objective reality could be described that in the end seemed to underlie the many differences of opinion that we had seen over the last few days. I suppose as a reductionist, you know, scientist, I find it very difficult, but it's obviously a valid world view, as it were, that there is a cosmos and is there something else, is there something more than the nuts and bolts of, you know, the biochemistry, the cells in our brain, everything like that, and I, I don't think there is. I'd be concerned at thinking that this was a, a drug which gave us access to God or to the cosmos or whatever. I think what it gives us access to are different interpretations, different ways of grasping the world you live in externally and a psychological world internally. Salvia is said to give access to hidden knowledge. And although we still didn't know about any possible long-term dangers, I felt that we'd all gained insight into the plant itself during the experiment. The next day, I gathered the team together over breakfast to get some initial impressions. 
you know, it really just sort of clears out and I feel refreshed and like I starting, it's like getting a very good night's sleep, you know, it's like mm, you wake up refreshed. You feel clear there? Yeah, yeah. Right. I, feel, I feel, yes I do. I slept very soundly and very, very peacefully actually. Later we met in the library to watch a recording of some of the events of the previous day. Okay. Do you think you'd be able to stand up? <laughs> right, um, I think that that's a very funny question. Okay. And, uh, I might be able to, but I don't think so. Okay. What was the meaning of Sean's laughter? John began our discussion with a straightforward explanation. I mean, the giggling's interesting because that suggests to me a removal of inhibition. I mean, yeah. normally you don't giggle most of the time. Usually when you're relaxed and enjoying something disinhibited, you start giggling. It wasn't giggling in the same way that if you're being um, physically tickled, yeah, which no. is, it was pleasurable giggling. It was actually yeah. giggling yeah, that yeah. felt very, Enjoy. very, very, yeah, it felt very nice indeed and it felt very positive and it felt very... Um, That's almost the same as a small amount of alcohol. The moment um, that you say it's, it's similar to a small quantity of alcohol is the moment at which that becomes um, an absurd thing to say. I, I'd like to say that um, I think that there's different qualities of laughter. And when I have this kind of deep laughter experience with Salvia, it feels like it's coming from a very, very deep place, like from my core of myself. And I never have that with alcohol. Sometimes I might find things a lot more amusing and be, laugh more freely. Okay. Tim and Francoise were inclined to agree and saw in the laughter a deeper, more complex response. What's interesting here is both of these two seem to know exactly what each other are talking about with regard to, say, this laughter. Laughter which is not specifically about something that they found funny, but a welling up from inside that, that this laughter is a very different sort of laughter. It may not be universal, but it's very common on people who take salvia. But yes, is that, but that you're, so you're suggesting this yeah. is totally unique to no. this drug? No, this I, think, I, I think it's quite likely that there are other drugs which may have a comparable effect, but it seems to be one regular effect that salvia has. And the euphoria that salvia creates is perhaps distinctive. It's, it's, it's perhaps what we are trying to, to get at in this conversation. There is a specificity to the euphoria that Salvia produces. Okay, if you can hold your arms out in front of you, okay, and close your eyes. Apart from John, the rest of the team thought the type of laughter we had seen was specific to Salvia. But why was it there? And what did it mean? And did it even, perhaps, hold the clue to the meaning of the experience? The difference between champagne giggling and uh, Sean's sort of giggling is, is that it was, there seemed to be some mental activity involved there, that it was his perception that caused the giggling and not an emotional uninhibition. Wouldn't it be true to say that any question you were asked op opened the a paradox to you and, yeah. and you perceive the fun from that because you could... You could that, see it one way or another. There was, it was like seeing a gap in the question. That's and what I was possibly, talking about it, earlier when I said that it, there was a massive yes. disparity between the fact that I was, I was seeing, as it were, seeing the, seeing the sort of puerile way I was behaving on the one hand, and at the very, you know, just giggling and being, acting the goat. And at the very same time, I was sort of um, off thinking... Right, now that's, yeah, that's really interesting. As I say, drawing comparisons with sort of painting and art and the things that are going on in the floor. Yes. And it's being able to actually hold these both and weigh them and look, good God, you know, there's, there's, um, this is, on the one hand, extremely um, sort of just a, a shallow pleasure, and on the other hand, or, or on the one hand it's a floor, and on the other hand it's a, you know, it's actually g yeah. looks for all the world like it could well be a mountain range, you know. Yeah. And that, that's a, that, if that's not a source of giggling, um, a reason for giggling, that's, I don't know what is, you know. Could it be that through taking salvia, the individual catches sight of the ambiguity of the world, an ambiguity that is normally obscured and hidden from us? The orange ones, you look like this little there's a whole row of them that went up the side of your arm and made that little chain that went up there and all those things were grey and red, and grey and um, orange reflectors. 
unlike Sean, I was seeing things that were not there. I wasn't seeing a, a exaggerated illusion, and that's what everything was. It was like a mosaic of these traffic reflectors. There were things in the room that could have triggered your response. So, again, to me, in the strict sense, hallucination is seeing something that is not there. You, um, you, all you did was possibly, I, I don't know because I didn't see it, but possibly it could be explained in you just misinterpreted what was there. Tim had an alternative account which challenged the idea that we normally see the world as it is and instead suggested that through perception we construct reality. Uh, you take in what information is available and you fill it in into holes so that you, see, you don't see just a set of lines, you see a television and on the television you don't just see uh, another set of colours and lines, you see a face and we know that this face is Sean. You're doing that all the time routinely. Mm. Now that means that you're making this world as much as this world is coming into you. It's not, you know, perceiving is not a passive experience. Now, what, what I think is apparent from the discussion so far and what they've described is that they saw things differently. Now, whether or not we call one an illusion, which is meant to be a misinterpretation, or an hallucination, where you have a perception in the absence of an object out there, um, might not be quite the point. It yeah, may not be the point. No, no, I think, it is I think, an important well, I think, an important I, th I think actually Daniel did describe hallucinations on, on, in terms of what the, the lines on mine. The, the fact that you've seen reflectors, there is no reflector whatsoever on my trousers. That is a proper hallucination. <laughs> yeah? That is a proper hallucination. The, their laughter, I think, is accurately portraying uh, a different perception of what's going on that the rest of us weren't seeing. I, I don't disagree with you in one sense. I disagree with the tone that it's coming over in, which is this is a sort of... We're all, you know, if you're normal and not taking the drug, you're missing something. Mm. There's something no, no. more out there. No, there isn't. No. All you're seeing is, is a slightly distorted no, view distorted. of what is there. Excuse me, people. I'd like to point out that one reason I think these plants are very useful, particularly something like Salvia divinorum, is that we develop a worldview and a way to consensually agree on, on what the world is. And we get so wrapped up in that perception, that cultural point of view, or human point of view, that most of us assume that's all it is and we believe it so much that we don't like having that shaken up it's threatening and something like this says look remember there's something else out there there's more to it than just the way you've been looking at it is there something mythical m magical uh, outside of the human experience that's coming in Actually, or is it just that there's a You've got the, the same world that I'm talking about, but you're just looking at it at a slightly different angle. In, in, in lots of ways, what I'd want to argue with you about is that there are many different ways of seeing things, many different aspects, ma many different ways of perceiving similar sorts of things. Now, we, we cannot grasp those things in themselves. We can't say, look, this is the reality of things. What we can do is we can come to some sort of judgment, some sort of evaluation about whether or not this particular way of seeing things works, whether or not it's pleasurable, whether or not uh, we can see other ways or, or whatever. Mm. The, the, we do are, that when we grow up right. as children. But what I mean, you that, seem that, to be that, saying is the there, whole is only, th there is one for. right way of seeing it. Mm. I don't know how we can know that. Sean and Daniel later returned to the forest where they had taken the salvia the previous night. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Part of the nation. Hmm. Yeah, so here's where we have the blanket. Oh, no. I remember all the flares out there. Everything looks so bland now, doesn't it? It's like... It does. I'm missing the two-tone effect of all the... You know, the light on one half of the tree and the... Blackness. Just complete blackness on the other, yeah. Yeah. I preferred it last night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Last night it didn't seem like there was any sky, well, because yeah, it was exactly black yeah. behind, but it seemed like the leaves just made a continuous fabric of, of almost like being in a tent. And we want now to get back to the question we began with about why this plant is so special in Mazatec society and what properties it has and what causes them. Francoise. Well, I, I have found the, the last two day sessions most illuminating in this very perspective. We have seen that taken in an experimental setting, in a controlled setting, 
Salvia produces the same effects which are described in the charts of the Mazatex. Here we have two subjects who don't who are not aware of this context and yet come up with the same perceptions of total fun, hilarious uh, sense of, of perspective and uh, a euphoric, peace-inducing state of mind. Mm -hmm. Tim, what do you think we've learned? I suppose as a, as a starting off point, I'd say I think we have learned something about salvia. It does appear to have quite a significant impact upon the people concerned. Now, when it comes to one of the questions that we raised, which was that does salvia uh, aid, in a sense, the recall of memories or hidden, forgotten uh, memories, I suspect it probably does. I mean, certainly with Daniel, what we did see was that Daniel began to, began to, I think, get into a state where these things would have been much more accessible to him. John, do you agree with that description of what was actually happening? Mm, I suppose not. It happens to have a psychotropic or psychomimetic compound in it, or compounds in it, that interfere with normal brain chemistry or brain activity, and that alters... Um, the perception of the world and you could find other substances that can do that as well. While John thought salvia was an interference, a negative threat to normal brain activity, Tim was more inclined to see it positively as enhancing memory. Daniel used the drug in, in a, in a, a semi-self-conscious way to explore in a space and that's almost what he, he did in front of us in, in the apparently experimental situation, he began to say, well, you know, look, the, 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 this space here is beginning to represent his, his own existence temporarily, and as the further you went away from where he was, the further backwards in time it went. And he even began to see a boy he hadn't seen for years and years and years, named him David. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I, I, I can't, I couldn't tell you where that would end. Mm. But it's persuasive enough for me to think that, that w w what, what these drugs might well be doing is making available to people competing interpretations of what's going on, yeah. internally and externally. Yeah. Both these the underlying difference in approach soon led to an argument about the potential uses of salvia. I would have thought that uh, as a candidate for, you know, for a, a more socially... Um, developed way of gaining different conceptions, different alternative competing ways of understanding the world we live in, our relationships, etc. I would have thought that, that this might be an exceptionally worthwhile drug if it was in the right, well-supported social context. I think the bottom line still is this is a, uh, a, a toxin. The plant made it as a toxin. This is a poison in reality. We don't know how it works. We don't know what really it does. You've got to do a risk-benefit thing on it. You know, what are the risks of taking this substance? What are the benefits? And at the moment, I can't really see any benefits, apart from a mild, semi-delusional state that's quite enjoyable. So I wouldn't at all sanction taking this compound, and I certainly wouldn't take it myself. In, uh, I, I, can't, I, I couldn't disagree with you more. I mean, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about a culture who have used these sorts of things for a great deal, you know, for, for a considerable length of time. Um, if, if, if we were going to do randomised control trials on every aspect of our culture, we would be... Uh, uh, yeah, we'd ban alcohol, we'd ban nicotine. It wouldn't be just be alcohol and nicotine. But I agree with John that we function within this culture and we have to abide by the rules yeah. and controls which operate no, in this culture. So randomised control trials have to be done if this plant is going to be used in a, clini in a clinical way to help people. Oh, okay. In a clinical um, way, there's no doubt about and, that. And even, and, but I disagree completely with John to say that this plant, the only uh, benefit of this plant is, is a mild recreational state. The, the plant is used by the Masatec as a tool, as an exploratory tool and as a teaching tool, and there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to translate it in our culture in those terms. You're right in one sense. That that's probably all right in that culture and they see the benefit. But I'm not sure that in our society that will be a benefit and we don't know what the risk is. I would want to know what the risks are. So the obvious question that we've been living with for 
the last 24 hours. Why is this plant thought to be sacred? Well, I think it comes down to it has a compound that interferes with our brain. Um, that interference creates something that's obviously pleasurable and interesting to the people using it, and um, they venerate that. Sacred probably because as an hallucinogenic, I would imagine used in, in the right context and with the right sorts of social pressures, could be regarded as gaining access to higher, more divine forms. And there's no doubt hallucinogenics, you know, they, they, they allow for that sort of experience to take place. I, I would say that nothing is sacred by itself. It's, it's, it's sacred because it can be integrated in the way that it suits the culture best. And its very flexibility and gentleness allow exploration of the mysteries of creation. It was, however, my guest's understanding of the nature of these mysteries and whether a single objective reality could be described that in the end seemed to underlie the many differences of opinion that we had seen over the last few days. I suppose as a reductionist, you know, scientist, I find it very difficult, but it's obviously a valid world view, as it were, that there is a cosmos and is there something else, is there something more than the nuts and bolts of, you know, the biochemistry, the cells in our brain, everything like that, and I, I don't think there is. I'd be concerned at thinking that this was a, a drug which gave us access to God or to the cosmos or whatever. I think what it gives us access to are different interpretations, different ways of grasping the world you live in externally and a psychological world internally. Salvia is said to give access to hidden knowledge. And although we still didn't know about any possible long-term dangers, I felt that we'd all gained insight into the plant itself during the experiment.